that's what I'm doing with the car. We have a lot of hawks here. How long have you been in Wedgefield? A year, about a, almost a few months, a year? About a year. About a year. Give or take. I, I think we bought in, well, I think we bought in November, right? Yeah. I think we lived here a while. I see hawks at least two times a year. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to East Orlando Hawk Service. Good morning, everyone. It's not a hawk service we're having this morning. It's a Sunday school class, but that's okay. We have, uh, we could do it all, right? Uh, we we make bread. We look at hawks. We fix cars. We we try to fix cars. So we're going to continue our study in Second Samuel this morning, and we're going to open up in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for this time that we have the privilege to open the bread of life, Lord God, to dig into your word, Father, to learn some things, to be strengthened, Lord God, to be edified. And to be instructed, Father, we pray you bless this lesson. Uh, we thank you, God, for those who are here, those who are online, and those who are on their way. We do pray we have a good service this morning, Lord God. Uh, fill us with your grace, Lord God. Fill us with, uh, with joy. And fill us, Lord God, with your peace. We thank you, Father. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So last few lessons, we've been looking at Absalom's rebellion, how Absalom uh, had a gathering behind him, and he was going, he took the city, he took the palace, and uh, his father and his, the, David and David's men fled to the land of Gilead. And now Absalom gathers his army. Uh, and they too have crossed the Jordan River and they're about to engage in battle. So we're going to pick up in chapter 17, verse 27. Second uh, Samuel, chapter 17, verse 27. And uh, let me see if I can get there. I usually turn in my Bible also. I have it in my notes, but give you a chance to, to turn there yourselves. Verse 27, and it came to pass when David was come to Mehanaim that Shobi the son of Nahash of Reba of the children of Ammon and Makir the son of Amiel of Lodabar and Barzillai the Gileadite of Rogelim brought beds and basins and earthen vessels and wheat and barley and flour and parched corn and beans and lentils and parched pulse and honey and butter and sheep and cheese of kind for David, for the people that were with him to eat, for they said the people is hungry and weary and thirsty in the wilderness. I would love to be there. I'm reading all these uh, food items and I'm getting hungry just reading them. So here we have a couple of uh, characters, about three, do you think it's a coincidence? Three of David's buddies that he's known for a while and they're there to help him. Shobi, the son of Nahash. Who remembers who Nahash is, was? Who remembers? Nahash, his name means serpents. Who remembers who he was? That was his son. Uh, yes, that was him. That was Nahash. Yes, that was Nahash. Nahash was the king of the Ammonites. And when uh, Saul sent men to the, uh, no, he went to the men of Jabesh Gilead. And he said, uh, surrender to us. And they said, no, we will not surrender. It said, uh, we're going to go seek help. And if we don't have seek help, what are the terms of peace? And he said, Poke out, pluck out your right eye and give it to us. I remember, that was Nahash. That was that Nahash. But David became friends with him, apparently, because uh, after David fled from Saul and running away from Saul, he became friends with the king of the Ammonites, Nahash. Shobi now is one of his sons. He had another son, too, who was king. Um, but anyways, Shobi was friends with David. Maycare also, and Barzillai. They helped David, and they brought a lot of food there. Uh, I mean, I would I would love to be there. That would be a good, uh, a good shindig, as far as I'm concerned, when you have uh, barley and co parched corn and beans and lentils. I love lentils. My mom used to cook them for me when I was a kid. I still love them to this day. And honey and butter and sheep. Roasted lamb, that's, we, that's one thing we want to do eventually. We want to roast the lamb back in our property. But hopefully one day soon. But these men are, I want you to notice, these men are given special mention in the scriptures. What God calls them up by name. Why do you think he does that? They were not left in the in the. the obscurity of history but God takes time to mention these men to us why why do you think he mentioned them? because they helped David they helped David and God wants to know he wants to take note that these men helped David God watches these things he watches when we're kind to each other when we're helpful <coughs> to each other when a brother or sister is in need are we there for them one of the tragic things about hu the human existence is, is, nobody to help, is no, there is no one there to help you sometimes 
when you're in need and when you need some, some help. God watches us when we lend a helping hand to someone in need, to a brother or sister in Christ who is in need. Someone said, friends in need are friends indeed. How true that is. And I'm sure God laid it on the hearts of these men to help David in his time of need. And you'll notice that the, David and his men were fed in the wilderness. They were fed in the wilderness. Does that ring a bell? Because one day, the Jews during the tribulation, they too, once they flee the land of Israel, when Christ says to them, when you see the abomination of desolation that's spoken by Daniel the prophet, flee, right? Did he not tell them to run away? And where, what will happen to them? Where will they flee? The woman fled in the wilderness, and she was fed there for 40 and two, 42 months. So here in chapter 18, we see the coming uh, showdown between uh, Absalom and his men and David and his men. Chapter 18, verse 1, And David numbered the people that were with him and said, Captains of thousands and captains of hundreds over them. That's a big crowd there. It was just not David and a handful of men that left Jerusalem and fleeing away from Absalom. He said, Captains of thousands and captains of hundreds over them. And David sent forth a third part of the people under the hand of Joab, and a third part under the hand of Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, Joab's brother, and a third part under the hand of <clears throat> Ittai the Gittite. And the king said unto the people, I will surely go forth with you myself also. But the people answered, Thou shalt not go forth, for if we flee away, they will not care for us. <clears throat> Neither if half of us die, will they care for us? But now thou art worth 10,000 of us. Therefore, now it is better that thou succor us out of the city. Succor is an old English word for help. And the king said unto them, What seemeth you best I will do? And the king stood by the gate side, and all the people came out by hundreds and by thousands. And the king commanded Joab and Abishai and Ittai, saying, Deal gently for my sake with the young man, even with Absalom. And all the people heard when the king gave all the captains charge concerning Absalom. Very important point here in this verse. So if you remember back when uh, Absalom was asking for advice, there were two men by his side, Ahithophel and Hushai. Ahithophel said to Absalom, uh, get a bunch of men right now and pursue David. Uh, don't give him an opportunity to flee across the Jordan River. Now's your chance to, to chase after him. And uh, Hushai, who was David's friend, who happened to be Absalom's advisor, said, no, uh, Absalom, don't do this right now. Uh, gather the entire army of Israel and uh, chase after David. Remember, David is with his, some of his best trained men. Uh, SEAL Team 6, the Delta Force, the Green Beret, the Rangers, uh, they're all there. They're around David. Uh, be careful. Don't, don't pursue them. You need more men. You need more weapons. You need more equipment to pursue them. But all this was done uh, to give by David some time. And it did buy David time because David was able to cross the Jordan River, set camp on the side of, on, in the land of Gilead. And here we read that he said he organized his men into three companies, led by Joab, Abishai, and Ittai, respectively. Uh, thousands of men were there. It wasn't just a small group of people. Thousands of men. Likewise, <clears throat> today you're going to see uh, a similar thing happening, I believe, in Christendom. Here in the land of Israel, there was a time where the people didn't want to follow David. They wanted to follow Absalom. But there were still men left who wanted to follow David. Today, uh, have you ever asked yourself, are you willing to follow Christ no matter what? We're living in the days of the, of the falling away. Uh, the Bible talks about in 2 Thessalonians the signs that we will see before the coming of the day of Christ. Uh, it talks about before the Lord comes to take his church. He, in fact, there's a question that we can apply practically in the New Testament. Will he find faith? Are you going to stick by the stuff? Are you going to stick with your Lord? Or are you going to go after the Absaloms of this world who promise you the world, who promise you are the world, but deliver an atlas? <clears throat> but you, the, the, the good thing is, I believe there's still Christians, and the scripture is clear on that, that God always has a remnant. God always has a remnant. I want to be part of that remnant, even if it means standing alone. In the, in the lesson chapter 16, we talked about this character called Ittai, the Gittite. We mentioned that several men that David had gotten to know in the land of the Philistines became what? Became his friends. And they knew David. They knew the character of David. So when David went back to Israel, guess what these men did? They went there with him. They left the land of the Philistines, the land of their pagan uh, ancestors, and they went and joined with David. Ittai was another man. And back in Lesson 16, we talked about, did we know who this man was? What was his background? But here you see three men mentioned. 
Joab, Abishai, and Ittai. So what is your guess? What was Ittai? Three generals. David took his entire military and broke it down into three camps, three companies. So what do you think Ittai's background was? Military. He was some kind of military leader in the land of the Philistines who became friends with David. And he left and he joined David. And if you remember back in Lesson 16, we talked that David, when Ittai came to see David, David says to Ittai, you just came to Israel. Uh, go back and stay with Absalom. He doesn't know what's going on. You can tell him that you just arrived and he, he's not going to harm you. But Ittai told David, uh, no, I'm going to stay with you. And back in the lesson, we mentioned that Ittai went back to Jerusalem. That was, that was, that was not right. I mentioned that uh, David pressed the issue and tells him to go back, and he does. But that was not right on my part. The truth is, Ittai did not go back, even though David pressed him to go back to Jerusalem. Uh, if we read 2 Samuel 15, 22, let's read that passage again clearly. Uh, 2 Samuel 15, verses 20 through 22. And here is the discussion that David is having with his friend Ittai, who just happened to arrive in Jerusalem as all these things were unfolding. As the rebellion of Absalom was unfolding, Ittai had just arrived. 2 Samuel 15, 20. Whereas thou camest but yesterday... Should I this day make thee go up and down with us? David is talking to Ittai. Seeing I go whither I may, return thou and take back thy brethren. See, thy bre he was not alone. Mercy and truth be with thee. And Ittai answered the king and said, As the Lord liveth, and as my lord the king liveth. Here's a pagan man who is confessing what? As the Lord liveth. Where do you hear about the Lord? From David. From David. As the Lord liveth, and as my lord the king liveth, surely in what place my lord the king shall be, whether in death or life, even there also will thy servant be. Is that your heart today regarding your lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, where he tells you, where he leads me, I will follow. I will say what he tells me to say. I will go where he tells me to go. I'll do what he asks me to do. In verse 22, and David said to Ittai, go and pass over. That is, okay, come with us. And Ittai the Gittite passed over and all his men and all the little ones that were with him. <clears throat> so Git Ittai says, no, David, I'm going to go wherever you go. He knew David was God's man. He knew David was a king over Israel. He knew the Lord God was a true God, and he decided to follow David. Paul says, be ye followers of me as I am a follower of God. And we have to be examples to the other, to the younger ones. Us older Christians, we have to be examples to the younger Christians. Uh, don't, don't be surprised. These young men look, will look up to you. Especially, they look up to you. They don't say it, they don't understand it, but they look to, up to the, the older men. We have to be an example for them. So here, David, as he's, when he broke, when he organized his men into three companies, he also expresses his desire to go into battle. Remember, David was a warrior. Uh, perhaps in those, he was likely in his latter years and he couldn't fight as well. His reflexes were not as fast, but he probably could still handle the sword better than, than, uh, than a newbie or a novice. But they didn't want him to come with them. Uh, they said uh, to David, stay here, stay here. They're going to want to, they're going to pursue you. They're not going to be after us. They're going to be after you. You stay here. You stay here and stay in the protection of, a, of, our, of our camp. Remember what happened the last time David stayed home and, not, and he didn't go into battle. Remember what happened last time? When the kings, it was a time of the season for the kings to go to battle, but David tarried behind in Jerusalem. What happened? Uh, he got into a mess with, with Bathsheba. He made a mess, mess of things. And perhaps this time he says, I'm not staying behind this time. <laughs> I know what God did to me after I sinned against him. But I think the reason uh, uh, the men didn't want David to go, I'm reading here, I'm reading into the text a little bit. What do we call it when you read into the text? I see Jesus. I see Jesus. It's I see Jesus. When you read a little bit into the text, I think the men knew that David had a soft spot for Absalom, and when time came to fight, he would have he would have probably uh, not fought as hard, in order that he may not see his son die. And they were probably they were likely afraid of that. They knew that David would have uh, would have been a, a, a not a sore spot, but a a, a detriment. To the success in the battlefield because he probably would have tried to protect his son at all costs and when you're in battle you you can't be indecisive in battle uh, a split second decision uh, can cause the life of you and your men so but they told him look they stay behind they're going to look for you they're not going to look for us and david listened to his leaders the leaders of that of, of israel told david no you're not coming with us you're going to stay behind 
And this is the sign of a true leader. What does he do? He listens to his men. Uh, uh, he listens to their advice. He heeds to their advice. He still has to make the final decision, but he welcomes advice. He welcomes input. In Proverbs 24, 6, the Bible says, For by wise counsel thou shalt make thy war. And in the multitude of counselors there is safety. I firmly believe that. I'm not a one, it's not a one-man show here. I'm not a, never going to be a dictator. Uh, the major decisions we have to agree on before we move forward. When we bought the land, it was, we, we, it was a unanimous decision that we said, let's go buy this piece of land. Now that we're building the building, uh, it was unanimous, but now we have some uh, cost overruns according to the builder because everything's going expensive because of the great economy that we're living in right now, right? Inflation is a good thing. Did you know that inflation is a good thing? <laughs> That's what they tell us. That's what our government tells us. I've heard them say it. <laughs> I've heard them say inflation is a good thing. Maybe in your world. And as these men were about to march out into battle, listen to what David tells them in verse 5. Deal gently for my sake with a young man, even with Absalom. You see that? He was a son. But think about this boy. What did Absalom want of David? He wanted him dead. He wanted his own father dead. Think about that. To reach a point in the family, the family drama, David's David was a man after God's own heart. But don't kid yourself, there was a lot of drama in his household. There was a lot of sibling rivalry. There was a lot of trouble between him and his, and his children and, and, uh, and his in-laws. Absalom wanted David dead. And, and that's what the advice Hushai, both Hushai and Ahithophel gave Absalom. In 2 Samuel 17, 2, Ahithophel wanted David dead. He said, I will kill him myself. And remember, I, we believe that Ahithophel probably was still uh, bent out of shape about what David did to his granddaughter. <clears throat> he probably never got over it. The Bible's not clear on that, but I think we connect the dots. We can probably say that's likely the case because the Bible is clear. Ahithophel was Bathsheba's grandfather. And, uh, and if you're a grandparent and you, don't, you see your grandkids, I'm sure... Um, some of the in-laws, they see the grandkids and they probably shake their head and say, I didn't raise my kids to raise their kids that way. And then uh, Hushai advises the same thing, but he says in a different manner. He said, uh, gather all Israel and go kill David. You're going to see in your life, you're going to have to make some decisions. Uh, David failed with his children. Uh, who else failed with his children? Anybody can give me examples in the scriptures off the top of your head? Samuel failed with his children. Who else failed with his children? Eli, he failed with his children. Do you see that's happening? Even though in the scriptures, God gives us examples of great men who follow him, some of these men were not perfect. They still had shortcomings and failures, and God is clear to show us that he's not looking for perfection. In fact, the, one of the commandments in the Old Testament is train, up your, uh, tra train your children. It's, it's the father's responsibility to do that. And you as a Christian are going to have to make these tough choices. You're going to have to choose who you're going to serve. If, I want to, just a side note here before, before we continue having my notes here. In the parable, of, uh, the parable of the nobleman, who happened to be a picture of Christ, what do you see? What did the servant say about the nobleman? Let me read it to you. Luke chapter 19, verse 14. But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. That's a general attitude among people the lost people don't want even to, don't even want him to be their savior but again i think this transcends even among christians today will you have christ reign over you oh i'm you're saved i don't doubt you're saved i don't doubt you've trusted christ as your savior i don't doubt that you believe that he is the son of god and he is the king and he is the lord of lords and the king of kings and he's the master and he's uh the he has the preeminent place but have you allowed him to be that in your life Absalom and his men said in their hearts, we will not have David to reign over us. They didn't want David to reign over us. He's too old. He's, not, he's too inactive. He's not doing. And today, many Christians live in a manner that says, we will not have Christ to reign over us. I don't doubt that he's a savior, but they have not made him Lord of all. That's a part of maturity as a Christian. You get saved, it's like a child. Does a child know that mom and dad are there in front of it at the beginning? He doesn't. 
he grows into the awareness that that's my mom and that's my dad and they care for me and they provide for me. Likewise, as a Christian, you know that Christ is God. Yes, he's Lord. But have you made him Lord over every area of your life, over your marriage, over your finances, over your career choices, over your uh, hobbies, over everything? He wants to be Lord, not just on Wednesdays and Sundays. He wants to rule over all of your life, not just the ones that you let him. So when I was a kid, the illustration that we used to use, have you let Jesus into all the rooms in your house? That's what they would teach us when we were kids. Chapter 18, verse 6, Absalom and his men are defeated. 18.6, so the people went out into the field against Israel, and the battle was in the wood of Ephraim, where the people of Israel were slain before the servants of David. And there was a great slaughter that day of 20,000 men. For the battle was there scattered over the face of all the country, and the wood devoured more people that day than the sword devoured. If you remember what we mentioned, the fact when David crossed over the land of Gilead, he didn't only have a couple of guys with him. He had thousands of men. And most of these men, what do you think were? Trained military men. Those who were fiercely loyal to David, who have been in battle with him year after year. They were with him, and he defeated the Syrians, they defeated the Ammonites, they defeated the Moabites, they defeated the Philistines. They were there with him, and they were going to die with David. <clears throat> and they fought against the men of Israel who took Absalom's side. And we mentioned how Absalom won the kingdom. Through what? Through deception and flattery. And what will the Antichrist do when he shows up according to the book of Daniel? Same thing. By flatteries, he will gain notoriety and power in this world, and people will follow him blindly. Likewise, these men followed Absalom blindly to their what? For what? For what? We mentioned several le in lessons ago that Absalom was a type of the devil, the Antichrist, and Judas, and we showed you the verses of how the typology. Now, types are, what, what's one thing about typology? Types are not perfect. They always fail, right? See, Annette's been listening. She's been listening. Types are not perfect. Types fail. But types give us an, a, a, a foreshadowing of what is to come and what the individual who will come will be like. One of the greatest flaws I believe the devil has that he thinks he's actually going to win. Why would you fight a battle if you think you're going to lose? If you think you're going to lose, what's the first thing that comes across your mind? If you see an overwhelming force, you're either going to surrender or find truce. truce or peace, conditions for peace. And we mentioned too, again, this is us reading into the text a little bit. And when I read into the text, I want to make sure that I'm reading into the text and you know about it. So that way you don't go running out these doors and say, Pastor Bobby said this, Pastor Bobby said that. Uh, Absalom was likely an entitled rich kid. Uh, now, not all children born in rich families are entitled, but we, the consensus is that if you've met some kids that come from very wealthy families, or they feel kind of entitled because that's how they've been raised. He probably never fought any type of battle. He probably never led any military. This is the first time he goes out. He goes out in his pride. And what happened to him? He fell. What does the Bible say? Pride cometh before, before fall and destruction before a haughty spirit. So that's what happened to Absalom. He thought his pride was going to win the battle. You don't win the battle with, uh, with uh, pride and, uh, and gumption. You win it with skill and planning and uh, meticulous uh, battle plans. Likewise, the devil thought he could overthrow God, and he's still trying to thwart God's plans. You're going to see as we get close to this battle, we're going to be bringing uh, types of the devil in because uh, when, the, the, when Lucifer rebelled against God, the only picture I believe that God gives of what happened was the, the, the picture between David and his son Absalom. I'm going to explain in a future lesson why, why you think that, why I think that. So one day the devil's going to realize that, that he, he's lost, but it'll be too late for him. No one can challenge God and come out on top, even you as a Christian. Uh, I'm not saying you challenge God, but how do Christians challenge God today, the average Christian? How does the average Christian challenge God? Sin, Sin and by living their own way by living in a manner that displeases God, by saying, you know, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. I'm, my, I'm a self-made man. I'm going to go down, 
I'm going to do things the way I want to do them. I don't care what the pastor says. I don't care what the teacher says. I don't care what the Sunday school teacher says. I don't care what my mom says. I don't care what she says. I don't care what they say. But you know what's going to happen? Eventually, it's going to catch up to you. I was teaching my kids a few days ago. I said, you stray from the Lord slowly. No Christian wakes up one day and says, you know, I'm going to quit following God today. It happens slowly, slowly, gradually. And I tell my kids, I've seen, I've seen people that I know, uh, 10, 15, 20 years, it eventually catches up to them. The Lord's not going to let them go. If you're a child of the king and you're straying from your father, guess what he's going to do? He's going to come after you. He's going to chase you. Why? Because he loves you because you're his child and he's not going to let you make a mess of things. But he's going to let you fall flat on your face to the point where you have no choice but to look up. Look up. As we have said, David and most of the men that were around him were battle-hardened veterans. War was, war was their life. And the Bible says the people of Israel were slain before the servants of David. And there was a great slaughter that day of 20,000 men. It was not a simple victory. It was a slaughter. It was an overwhelming defeat. What were they thinking going up against the, probably the most well-trained military of the world in that day? It's like uh, uh, Somalia wanting to wage war with the United States. I don't know why that came to my head. The squirrels are running around rampant sometimes in my head. What was that? The battle, yeah, the similar odds, yes, the similar odds. If you remember, uh, was it Black Hawk Down? I, I remember reading the, the stats, it was like 50 to 1 kill ratio between the United the U.S. soldiers and the Somalis. They don't publish all the numbers because they would make, look, make us look like the bad guys. But it was like 50 to 1 was the kill ratio. Now, something interesting here, God tells us in this text, we're told that the wood devoured more people that day than the sword. What does that mean, that the wood devoured more people that day? Did the trees start chomping on the men? Were the trees hungry? Didn't they have dinner that day? Did they reach down with the branches and start poking the soldiers or choke them out? Did they, did they lift up the roots and start tripping the soldiers that went by? What, what does that mean, the wood devoured more men than the sword did? The text tells us that the trees were responsible for more men getting killed than those who actually died in battle by the sword. Before we get too far into the woods, the, we are given an example here in the text. In chapter 18, verse 9, the Bible says, And the Absalom met the servants of David, and Absalom rode upon a mule, and the mule went under the thick bows of a bow is a big branch, a bow, thick boughs of a great oak. I bow before that, the, the, the clarification. Under the thick boughs of a great oak, oak and his head caught hold of the oak and he was taken up between the heaven and the earth and the mule that was under him went away what a loyal animal <laughs> i'm getting out of here i'm running away the forest was the wrong place to engage in battle uh, trees provide cover uh, but trees also uh, the forest does provide cover but it itself it presents an inherent danger a cavalry charged through a forest and think about that they're running out and remember back in that day they didn't have glasses I look around over here, and if I count the number, there's probably eight of us or nine of us, ten of us here. Uh, how many are wearing glasses this morning? At least the majority. You can take it. <laughs> should be everyone. <laughs> so think about in that day when they didn't have correction lenses. Uh, uh, Henry Ede and was not didn't, was not employed back then. Sarah Ede hadn't graduated school, and uh, Daniel's shaking his head. <laughs> but think about it. They're running because his dad is not an optician and his sister's an uh, optometrist. So they're running through the forest. Do you think they can see a branch or a tree clearly? Right into the tree. The animal is just going to go through and make sure he doesn't get uh, uh, caught in the branches or the vines. But the guy running on the, on the animal, the horse or mule, whatever they were on, he's going to get beheaded or knocked in the head by a branch he can't see or he can't focus on too well. Think about that. I don't. These are the things I think about sometimes running into a tree, lifting up his sword, about to strike the man, and, oh, there goes a branch, there goes a sword. Now he's out without a sword. Uh, vine hanging there, he gets caught with a vine, on his, his neck gets caught with a vine, a guy tripping over a root, an animal stumbling over a pit that he didn't see. Uh, there's a lot of dangers in the forest. It's possible that some men strayed too, too far from the company and they were met with a bear or a lion or, 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 or a pack of wolves. Some fell into swamps or pits. They were, and then being trapped there, they were cut down by David's men. The wood devoured more people than the sword. 
And I'm sure God had something to say about that too. Now, Absalom, the great leader, notice the, the, the details that the Bible give us. We've got to ponder them, ponder at them sometimes. Absalom was riding a what? A mule. A mule. He's the great leader of Israel, and he's riding a mule. Why, why wasn't he on a horse? Right? If you, a, cal, a cavalry charge is done by what? Horses, not mules. Yeah, they're, they're battle-trained horses, not mules. So this is Absalom. What God is doing is, I think he's painting us a picture of what Absalom thinks, thinks he is and what he actually was. He was not the great leader. He would have been riding a horse, and he would not be, he would not be in the forefront. Maybe he couldn't ride a horse. Riding a mule and riding a horse are two different things from what I read. They're different animals. They behave differently. They walk differently. Uh, they're built a little differently. So uh, when you you got to learn how to ride a mule, and likewise you got to learn how to ride a horse. We know that the the king's sons were given mules. Now mules are strong as stronger than horses, and they are more uh, sure-footed, but they're not as nimble and not as fast as horses. Second Samuel thirteen twenty nine. And the servants of Absalom did unto Amnon as Absalom had commanded. Then all the king's sons arose, and every man gat him upon his mule and fled. Now, perhaps mules were better for riding uh, long distances and for the terrain, but uh, everyone used horses in battle. Donkeys and mules have been used in warfare since the ancient times, uh, and usually not always for riding. They were uh, used for pulling equipment, uh, for transport, for supplies. Uh, uh, horses, though, are more fearless in battle and more nimble. And they tell us in World War I, the British Army realized they needed about 15,000 horses a month in World War I. They didn't have tanks in those days. And that's how many horses they were losing. And they calculated that almost half a million horses owned by the British Army were killed during the First World War. We talk about the loss of life in the wars, but sometimes we don't mention the loss of the tragedy that the animals suffer themselves because of men's, of men's wars. So here in Absalom is in the forest, and he was caught uh, by the head by some branches. Think how difficult that is. In the Sunday school class, we're told that his hair, he had long flowing hair, long bushy hair. Uh, perhaps he missed, uh, he missed his appointment with a barber that day, and we're always shown that he was caught in his hair. I remember, I remember that in Sunday school class. Maybe you weren't taught that, but I remember that from Sunday school when I was a kid. But the Bible says his head caught hold of the tree. Think about that. That must have been, the branch had to be, uh, as, as he was walking through the forest, the branch had to be at the right location, had to be at the right angle, had to be split in a certain way, and it had to be concealed enough that he couldn't see it. Do you see what I'm saying here? Maybe he then, maybe the next day he should have, he should have, he should have called his barber. But... I think God had a hand in this. I think God had a hand in this and led him exactly down the right path to the point where the, the tree was just there, the branches were wide enough, forked enough, at the right height, tangled enough to be able for him to get caught by the head. And the thing is, he was trapped in those branches because we'll read that someone sees him and goes and tells Joab. So whatever it was, however he was caught in the branches, it was enough to keep him from freeing himself, from delivering or from breaking the branches or from wiggling out of it. The Bible says he was taken up between the heaven and the earth. One commentator said he was rejected by both. How true that is. <laughs> yeah. He, the earth didn't want him and heaven didn't want him. He was rejected by both. And that's the devil too. That's the devil. The devil eventually is going to be taken and be thrown into a pit. More on that in a moment. But what was hidden, the the... The rebellion goes at a deeper level. What was hidden from Absalom and his men was, or they couldn't see it themselves, that God had promised to protect and to preserve David. So when Absalom and the men of Israel were going up against David and his men, guess who were they fighting against? Hmm? They were fighting against God. And I'm sure as they were running through the forest, charging the men of Israel, the men of David, God had something to do with it, I'm sure. 
In Acts 5.39, Gamaliel said, But if it be your God, ye cannot overthrow it, lest happily ye be found even to fight against God. And I believe that's what Absalom's men. They were actually not only fighting David, they were fighting against God. Chapter 18, verse 10, the death of Absalom. And at a certain, and a certain man saw it. What did he see? Chapter 18, verse 10, he saw Absalom hanging from a tree. Caught, his head was caught in a tree. How his head was caught in a tree, I can tell you. But I believe what the Bible says, uh, it was, he was caught in a tree and told Joab and said, Behold, I saw Absalom hanged in an oak. And Joab said unto the man that told him, And behold, thou sawest him, and why didst thou not smite him there to the ground? And I would have given thee ten shekels of silver and a girdle. And the man said unto Joab, Now, listen to what, how he responds to Joab. Though I should receive a thousand shekels of silver in mine hand, yet would I not put forth mine hand against the king's son, for in our hearing, the king charged thee in Abishai and Ittai, saying, Beware that none touch the young man Absalom. Otherwise, I should have wrought falsehood against mine own life, for there is no matter hid from the king. And thou thyself wouldst have set thyself against me. I trust in Joab, right? Then said Joab, I may not tarry thus with thee. And he took three darts in his hand and thrust them through the heart of Absalom while he was yet alive in the midst of the oak. And ten young men that bare Joab's armor compassed about and smote Absalom and slew him. And Joab slew the, uh, blew the trumpet, and the people returned from pursuing after Israel, for Joab held back the people. And they took Absalom and cast him into a great pit in the wood and laid a very great heap of stones upon him. And all Israel fled everyone to his tent. So what I gleaned from this passage here is that he was caught pretty good in the branches. Enough so that one man ran back to Job and said, Hey, I saw Absalom, and he's caught, and he's hanging from a tree. So Job cast, Job cast against the young man and said, If you saw him there, why didn't you kill him? Why don't you strike him dead? Why don't you come tell me? You're a soldier. And then the man responds to Job and says, Had I killed him, you yourself would have turned against me and reported me to the king. And had the king given a command, you would have been the first one to kill me. What does that say about Joab? He was no, no one trusted him. They followed him as their leader, but they didn't trust him. Because that man, from his testimony, he, he knew Joab. He knew what type of individual Joab was. And he feared that he would be double-crossed by Joab himself. No amount of reward would have, put, would have made him trust in Joab. You meet people like that in life? Uh, I had some co-workers I work with, uh, but I wouldn't trust them as far as I could throw them. I work with them every day and gladly work with them. We have a good working relationship, but I don't trust them. Because the first moment, uh, they would do whatever they can to promote themselves and to uh, step on you so they can get the next step and next position. It's unfortunate, but that's what, how it is. And the, the man says to Job, you heard what the king said. You heard that he told you and Abishai and Ittai, you top three generals, he told you guys not to, not to harm him. You heard it. So you're asking me to kill him? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. So this character, Joab, and remember, he was the man who brought Absalom back from exile. Remember when David, uh, we again, we believe that uh, after Absalom had Amnon killed, he was exiled and he went to the land of Jeshur. And it was Joab who talked to the king and, and uh, facilitated the reconciliation between David and Absalom. And then it was Joab again who made sure that Absalom had an audience with the king. So perhaps, perhaps, Joab felt guilty that this rebellion was, he, it was partly his fault. Have you ever met, uh, uh, met some people that uh, they turn out some way and you had some part in their upbringing or in their formation and you feel kind of guilty because they didn't turn out exactly like you expected them to? Or uh, they, they took a wrong turn in life and you know that at some point in their life you were instrumental in leading them or directing them. I think about that sometimes. I meet some people and I see how they ended up. Now, I'm not saying they're bad people or, or evil people, but I had a part in their, in their formation when they were younger. And I see them now and, and it kind of weighs on me a little bit, weighs on me a little bit. I feel kind of responsible for the way they, they may have ended up. Again, I just, just me. This is just me speaking as a human. In the end, we're all... Uh, we're all bound by our own decisions and uh, we're adults and we make our own decisions and, and we have to suffer the consequences of our decisions but sometimes I think about these things so Job was one of those men who proved to be useful but also he was unruly 
uh, he would be the first one you want him by your side in the battle, but the last one if things turns against you. That's the kind of job, uh, that's the kind of man Job was. If you wanted to fight an enemy, you'd call Job. But if the things were going south and things were not going according to plan, uh, he'd be the first one you'd watch out for. We're told that 10 young men, think about this, 10 young men carried Joab's armor. The armor bearers, remember the armor bearers back in the day? Uh, they would actually, uh, in, in Goliath's case, Goliath has an armor, had an armor bearer. What did Goliath's armor bearer carry? A shield. So the armor bearer was a young soldier in training who would help the veteran soldier in battle. Job had 10 of these men around him carrying his armor. Uh, Job was the type of soldier who knew how to kill a man 30 different ways. Uh, he was not a man you'd want to you'd meet face to face in battle. Uh, <clears throat> and he knew how to handle any weapon and he knew how to counter any weapon. So imagine this, 10 young men, spear, shield, arrows, sword, dagger. You know, that's what he did. He commanded his men that were around him and he, he saw the situation. He saw the soldiers coming out and he would say, okay, spear. And that's, that's, what, that's how they, they fought back in the day. So here you have Joab uh, juxtaposed with Absalom, who probably never fought a war in his life, who probably never picked anything heavy in his life. He had servants do it for him. Uh, servant, open the door for me. Uh, servant, get my mule ready. Servant, cook my dinner. I'm reading between the line again, between, between the lines. And what else do we know about Absalom? He what? He couldn't get himself out of a tree, yes. But what else <laughs> What else do we know about him? I'm going to give you a hint. Birth order. What else do we know about him? But the big clue is birth order. He was, he was next in line to be the king. Because Amnon was the firstborn. He died. There was another young man, Chiliab, from Abigail. He's only mentioned once, and we believe he probably died when he was young or died in battle, was a soldier, whatever. We don't know the story of Chiliab. So Absalom was next in line for the throne. So had he, had he overlooked what Amnon did to Tamar <clears throat> and trusted that David was still king, though he did not agree with everything David did, and submitted to his father's authority and did all he could, then he would have been king and he, would have been, he could have righted the wrongs of his father. But he didn't. He wanted to be king then and there. He wanted to be. Sit, he wanted to sit on the throne of Israel before his time. And the end. What ended up happening to him? He lost everything. What was his end? A humiliating death. A humiliating death. Think about that. Hanging from a tree from your head, and you can't get yourself out of it. And you're a sitting duck. Literally, you're a sitting duck. A hanging duck. A humiliating death and a forfeiture of all that he could have had. He was next in line to be king. There will be many Christians who will stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and they will see what they had forfeited because they pursued worldly treasures and worldly ambitions. That's going to be, there's two, tragedy, two tragedies in life. One, a man not getting saved, in the same manner using the term generically. And the other tragedy is the, is the Christian forfeiting his eternal inheritance not doing all that God had asked him to do. And when he's going to stand before Christ, all that he has done is going to be burned up. Remember the Bible says we, what we need to lay up what? Treasures in heaven. If our works are wood, hay, and stubble, what will happen to them? They will burn up. They will burn up. And then they took Absalom and cast him into a large pit in the woods and laid a very large heap of stones over him. This is a type of the devil. Now I have some notes here. I'll try to go them quickly. Now, what happens to the, uh, to, the, to the devil at the end of the tribulation? He's cast into a pit, and he's shut up. Revelation chapter 20, verse 3. He's just cast into a pit. You see the similarities there? And what happened to Absalom? Uh, the tragedy was not only that Absalom died, but 20,000 men died with him who followed him, who believed in his lies. Isn't that sad? They lost their lives... 20,000 men lost their lives following a dream and a movement that went to nowhere. And the last verse we're going to look at this morning before we close is chapter 18, verse 18. Uh, 1818, do you see there? 1818, what's six times three? Just, just thinking out loud. Now Absalom in his lifetime 
had taken and reared up for himself a pillar, in verse 18, which is in the king's dale, for he said, I have no son to keep my name in remembrance, and he called the pillar after his own name, and it is called unto this day Absalom's place. Who else went into his own place in the New Testament? Who? Judas. Judas, Judas went in his own place. <coughs> Absalom had his own place named after him. See, the, 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 it's not a coincidence. These things are not a coincidence. I don't believe in coincidences in the scriptures. But as you read this verse, 1818, there'll be those who are going to raise up their arms and going to start waving, contradiction, contradiction. Back in 2 Samuel 14, 27, the Bible says, and unto Absalom there were born three sons and one daughter whose name was Tamar. She was a woman of fair countenance. And here the Bible says he had no sons. Well, in the other verse, he had, th he had three sons. Well, hold on a second. Put on your, put on your thinking caps. What could have happened from one verse to the next? Hmm? His, his sons could have died young. They could have been eaten by a bear, strangled by a vine. They could have been caught in a tree themselves. But you see, you use your thinking caps. They could have died. Uh, people died back in the day. So the, it's a possibility that Absalom was growing up and he had three boys and eventually the boys met their end somehow, some way the Bible doesn't tell us. But it came a point in his life where he saw, I have no more children, I have no more sons left. So to not be forgotten, he sets up a, a pillar. He sets up a, a pillar for himself. Does that ring a bell? He sets up a pillar for himself, called it after his own name. The, what will the Antichrist do during tribulation? He will set up an image. And what is the image called? What does the Bible call this image? The abomination of desolation. <clears throat> the abomination of desolation. And I want to read a couple of verses from the book of Isaiah. Now, Isaiah chapter 14 is a very key chapter. Uh, although it, it seems to be addressed to the king of Babylon, Isaiah chapter 14 is speaking of who? Lucifer. And the fall of Lucifer. The fall of Lucifer. Uh, if you look at Isaiah chapter 14, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Language is very important in scripture. Absalom was thrown into a what? Into a pit. And verse 19 of chapter 14, now again, the chapter 14 of Isaiah, the context is uh, the fall of Lucifer, the fall of Lucifer. But thou art cast out of thy grave like an abominable branch as the raiment of those that are slain, thrust through, you see the language there? It's not coincidence. Thrust through with a sword that go down into the stones of the pit. Absalom was thrown in a, and he was covered with stones. Words are very important in Scripture. The Holy Spirit doesn't do anything by coincidence. As a carcass trodden under feet. Verse 21. Prepare slaughter for his children, for hit the iniquity of their fathers, that they do not rise, nor possess the land, nor fill the face of the world with cities. And verse 22, For I will rise up against them, saith the Lord of hosts, and cut off, do you see that? Cut off. All the, the progeny of Absalom is cut off. From Babylon, the name, and the remnant and son and nephew, saith the Lord. And the context of this chapter, again, we said it's Isaiah 14.12. It describes the fall of who? If you look at 14.12, Isaiah chapter 14.12, very important verse in the Bible, it says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Do you see that? How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? So who, if you ask, if you go out into the world and you ask a lost person, you say, uh, you ask the lost person, who is Lucifer? What do you think they're going to say? Satan. Satan. Even the lost people know who he is. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Now, this chapter seems to be written to uh, the king of Babylon, but it's God's judgment against the anointed cherub. And likewise, Absalom met his demise. Uh, he had an untimely end, and he was thrown into a pit, uh, covered with stones, and that's how he was remembered. That's how he was remembered. A son of the king. What an end. What an end to Absalom. Revelation 19, 19 says, And I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him, the seven horse, and against his army. Likewise, Absalom and his men and their armies gathered to make war against David and against him who sat on the throne of Israel and against his army, but they were slain. That's the end of all rebels. You cannot fight against God and win. So we're going to continue the story 
uh, with Absalom next week, and we're going to see when David hears the news of his son's death, uh, he, he just lo almost loses it. Yet another son he lost. Okay, uh, we're going to end here, and we're going to be back in about uh, 10 minutes. It's eight minutes for Sunday morning service.